The Gospel according to St. John, chapter 2. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, Get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, It's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Like every good, God-fearing Jew... Jesus and his disciples were on their way to Jerusalem to celebrate one of the great major three festivals in the Jewish religious life, the Passover. That day to remember how God had rescued their ancestors from slavery in Egypt, brought them out miraculously, and then eventually brought them right to the promised land where they were still living at Jesus' time. A wonderful, wonderful event for them to commemorate for them to come together from all over, hundreds of thousands of Jews who would join together there in Jerusalem at the temple to offer their thanks and praise and worship to God. And people were coming from all over the place, and some of them from hundreds of miles away. And and as you know, 2,000 years ago, there was no mass transportation for them to jump on and get there quickly. You had to walk. (laughs) And you had to take everything with you that you needed along on your journey. And one of the things that you needed to go up to Jerusalem for one of these major festivals was an offering. An offering based on, the, in proportion to how God had blessed you. It, it might be a lamb, some cattle, a dove. But you'd take that up with you, and you had to, to take that so that you could offer that, that sacrifice. Thanks and praise for God's goodness and his faithfulness and his love. Well, somewhere along the way, someone got what seemed like a a really smart idea that why wouldn't we make it more convenient for people? Why have people travel all these miles with their offerings? Why not just make them available here? Right, that, that they can come here and they can, they can buy their, their cattle, their sheep, their doves, whatever they need to, to offer their sacrifices at the temple. It made a lot of sense, right? And then you've got all these people coming from all over who have all different kinds of currency. And they're going to have to pay the temple tax when they get here, like a good God-fearing Jew does. And so we can exchange money for them too. We'll make it really convenient and easy. But the problem, where do we do this? Where do we make it convenient so people aren't having to run all over town trying to figure out where do I get my offerings and change my money? We could do it right at the temple. We could do it right in the courtyard of the Gentiles. How convenient. Now, I guess you have to to know the the setup of the temple to understand, well, what's the courtyard of the Gentiles? All right, so picture this with me. You have the temple, the actual physical building of the temple. Well, no one went in there except for the priests. To do their duties. Outside of that temple was the courtyard of the Jews. So right outside that temple is where the Jewish people got to go in and worship and offer their sacrifices and, and hear God's word. Outside of that court of the Jews was the court of the Gentiles. And it's in that court of the Gentiles that the non-Jews, who were believers in the true God, were able to come and worship. And offer their praise and thanks to God. And it's here in this courtyard of the Gentiles that these people are set up. Selling their animals and exchanging their money. But as you picture that temple and and the surrounding area in your mind, 
you can come to that conclusion and understand that everyone who goes up to the temple to worship has to go right through the courtyard of the Gentiles. And it was distracting. A, a place of worship that is filled with animals and all the sounds they make and all the smells they make. Right? Maybe the bartering going on. Right? The, the money changers, you know, calling, hey, come over here, I'll take care of you. Right? It, this, this place of worship had become a market. And Jesus gets there and he's not all too happy about it. Now, maybe originally it, it was a, a good idea. It was for convenience. But, but Jesus, he does this actually two times. This is the first time he does it. He does it later on during Holy Week. That's probably the one you're more familiar with. And there, he, he drives them out and he calls them a den of robbers. So even though it might be for convenience sake, it, it's obvious that, that they're cheating people here. And, and, you know, you understand, maybe a little. I, it's about convenience. I, I'm sure that the, the, the temple tax, uh, the, the currency exchange rate for that is pretty low. Because right, you're right there. What choice do you have? You need to pay it. And, and the offerings that were there, the, the animals that were available there, well, it's all about convenience, isn't it? You didn't have to drink it all the way here. Right? Prices were jacked up. Right? It's like when you go to a, you know, a professional baseball game, you pay four bucks for a hot dog you can make for 25 cents at home. Right? It's about convenience. No matter what the reasons were, why they were doing it, Jesus comes and sees it, and he's not happy. <laughs> right, Jesus' disciples think they're just being like good, God-fearing Jews, and they're going up to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover like all the other Jews who are going, but Jesus has something else in mind when he gets there. The Passover takes place in spring, and Jesus says it's time to do some spring cleaning. <laughs> like a good, obedient son to his father, Time to clean out his father's house. And this is what happens. They go up to Jerusalem. And in the temple courts, Jesus finds people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables, exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. This isn't the usual Jesus you think of, is it? <laughs> this is Jesus filled with indignation, righteous anger. And at this point, he's not really well known. Again, this is, this is John chapter 2. This is really early in his ministry. You know, when he does it a second time in Holy Week, well, then everybody knows who Jesus is. But here, like, who is this guy? But do you see their reaction? They leave. <laughs> they take off. They scatter. We see this different kind of Jesus here, don't we? I, I don't know if you've ever seen this in an artist's rendition hanging above a child's bed. Right? Jesus with a whip and yelling and flipping over tables, right? No, what do we picture with Jesus? We, we see the good shepherd holding a lamb. Or we see the children sitting on Jesus' lap. And what does his face look like? It's, it's warm. It's gentle. This is not the Jesus we see here. And his disciples are there, and they see all this happening. And, and again, they haven't been following him very long. Maybe they're wondering, what did we get ourselves into with this guy here, right? But John records for us that the Spirit helped them understand. He quotes from Psalm 69, They remember that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. Jesus is, is filled with zeal for his father's house, and he is just absolutely aghast at what they have done to the temple, a place that's supposed to be for worship, a place where people can come and, and, and be in God's presence, where they can, they can hear his word and offer their sacrifices and their thanks and praise. This place of reverence had become a place of retail. <laughs> and Jesus is not happy zeal for his father's house consumes him. And it still does today. Zeal for the temple, his father's house, 
the place set aside for his people to gather and worship, Jesus has great zeal for that place too that consumes him today. That day he drove out all of those things that did not belong there. All of those things that were corrupting true worship of the true God. Jesus cleansed that temple that day and and maybe it's good for us today to ask Does this temple need some cleansing? Are there some things that need to be driven out of here, of this place of worship, this place set aside for God's people to gather in God's presence, in his word, to worship and offer thanks and praise? Are there some things that this temple, this house of the Lord, this church needs to be cleansed of? Maybe it's good for us to consider. What do people see when they come here? What do they see about our building and property? What do they hear in conversations out in the entryway among our members? What do they hear in our services? What do they witness as they watch us? What is it that maybe Jesus needs to drive out of this temple? Is it a lack of love for one another? Is it maybe ignoring the one who's hurting and lonely? What is it that Jesus maybe needs to drive out of of this place of worship? It is, is it our apathy towards worship? That it's just kind of a going through the motions? I'm here. <laughs> That's got to count for something. And maybe it's checking the watch every once in a while, seeing what time it is, and looking how many pages are left in the service folder until I can get out of here and get on with the rest of my day. Is it an apathy towards hearing his word and being in his word with fellow Christians? You know, oh, that, that Sunday school and Bible class hour that we're invited to come to an hour earlier, that, that's just too much Jesus on one morning. I don't know if I can take all that. I don't have time for that. <laughs> what is it that Jesus needs to drive out of this temple that doesn't belong here? Is it the, I'm here to be served, rather than realizing I'm here to serve? Mentality? Is it the someone else will volunteer to do that type of thought? Whatever it is, whatever it is that this temple, this place of worship needs to be cleansed of, I hope and pray that along with me you say, Jesus, come and cleanse us of that. That doesn't belong here. This is where you dwell among your people. Jesus, come and drive out these sinful thoughts and attitudes, our complacency, our laziness, our going through the motions. Come and drive that out, Jesus, and again, set us back on what this is all about. Gathering around the means of grace. Coming and being strengthened through word and sacrament to come and receive what God wants so desperately to give us. And to see... How he gathers us together as a church to love and serve and give and encourage and support one another. Right? To drive out this attitude of just playing church, but actually to be the church. To actually set us back on the mission and the ministry that God has given to this church and every Christian in it to hear and to herald the gospel. Jesus, if there's anything that would prevent us from doing that, drive it out. Cleanse this place. Cleanse this temple so that we might get back to what this is all about, worshiping you and living out that in our life. But you know, maybe before we can do that collectively, as a church, as a gathering of believers, maybe we've got to do that individually. And ask What is it that this temple 
needs cleansing of. Because you are a temple. God calls you that through the Apostle Paul. He says, your body is a temple in which the Holy Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit dwells. So look inwardly here. And ask yourself, what is it that I need Jesus to drive out of me and cleanse me of? What is it that's keeping me from, from total commitment and true devotion and true worship of my God? What, what part of my heart am I still holding back from, from wanting him to have all of it? What sins am I choosing to hold on to that, that I need to be cleansed of? Is it worry? Or anger? Or an unforgiving heart? Maybe it's lust? Maybe it's getting caught up in the things of this world, the materialism or the busyness, and that's where we're trying to find our value and our worth and our joy and our hope? Is it in comparing ourselves to each other and thinking somehow that makes us right to God? Whatever it is, whatever is keeping you from actually being his temple, committed to him completely, number one, recognize it. Stop ignoring it. Stop pretending it's not there. And then repent of it. And turn to the one who alone can cleanse you. The one who alone can make your heart clean. Who can drive out that sin and fill it with things that you can't come up with on your own and this world cannot give you. And how can you trust this one that he can actually cleanse your heart and make it pure and holy, and make it completely dedicated to him? How can you? No. Because he was willing, in his great love for you, to take his temple, his body, which was pure and holy in every way, and allow it to become marred with your sin, your filth. And that as all that sin was placed on him, on his body, he allowed that temple to be destroyed. The Jews who were there, as Jesus cleansed that actual physical temple that day, said this to him. He said, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all of this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. The temple he was talking about, John tells us, was his body. That he would allow that body, that temple of his, to be destroyed. For you, and for me to take the curse of our sin upon himself for all of the sins that we choose to hold on to, for all the times that we have not let him have all of our heart, when we have put so many other gods and idols before him in our selfishness, in our trying to find our value and our love and our worth in so many wrong places, and in the comparing of ourselves to, to one another, Jesus went and allowed his body to be destroyed for all of those sins. but only as Jesus promises to take it up again. That that body would be raised again to assure us that now, through his death and through now his resurrection, we might have life. Real life. A life in which the Holy Spirit can dwell within us and give us a new heart with new thoughts and new attitudes, with new desires and new motives that finally realizes what this life is all about. <laughs> set free from our selfishness. Set free from going through the motions. Set free from the worship of ourselves. Set free to worship him. These Jews didn't believe. And they wouldn't. Many of them wouldn't believe for the next three years of Jesus' ministry, all the way to to having a hand in his death. And the disciples, at least right now, don't get it either. 
Right? It, it says there that the, the, the Jews reply, it's taken 46 years to build this temple, and, and you're going to raise it in three days. But the temple he spoke of was his body. And it was after he was raised from the dead that his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Brothers and sisters, we have an advantage over these Jews and these disciples. We, we get to see the whole picture. We know how it all turns out. <laughs> we get to see all of these Old Testament prophecies fulfilled in this Christ. Right? Every single sacrifice that had been offered, any, every animal who had to shed its blood for the forgiveness of sins in the Old Testament was all a pointing forward to that Lamb of God who would come to take away the sins of the world, who would be that once-for-all sacrifice. Right? We are blessed to know that even that Passover... That event was a foreshadowing of what Christ would come to do. That he would die in our place. His blood would be shed so that God can pass over us and not destroy us. Even that temple, that physical building, was a foreshadowing of what Christ would come to do. That he would come to be a place where we get to dwell in him and with him and live with him, that, that as Paul says, that we get to join together in Christ to be a holy temple rising to the Lord in his glory. Right? We have the blessing of knowing all of this and the faith to believe it. And so, dear Christians, in these days of Lent and beyond, may our prayer continually be, Jesus, come and cleanse this temple. Right? When, I, when I continue to fall into these sins, come and cleanse me again with your holy, precious blood. Come and take me back to the waters of my baptism and remind me that I am yours. Come through these means of grace and the word and through, and through, your bread and, uh, through the bread and wine and your body and blood and the supper. And again, cleanse me. Wash my heart clean so that my life can be what it's really meant to be. Worship. True devotion, total commitment, worship, knowing fully that zeal and that love that consumed him for you, that led him all the way to being crucified for you. Worship. To see our lives as the opportunity to offer our bodies as living sacrifices. Paul says that's our spiritual act of worship. That our lives belong to him who purchased us with his own blood. And how he longs to take our whole heart and make it his. To fill it with all of the blessings only he can give. That peace and that forgiveness and that joy and that life. And that hope of a life beyond this one. Let our prayer be, Jesus, come and cleanse this temple. Let us be yours. And yours alone. Amen.